Hey everybody, Wire is here. A month ago I announced that I was going to start working on a custom scripting language for my game engine, and I'm excited to show you the progress I made on it. While it's not ready to be used yet, it's surprisingly close. Which is good, because I actually want to start making things with the engine. Since Teehee last video, I've added floating point variables, boolean variables, if statements, while loops, and structures. The weirdest thing so far has been what I expected to be hard was a lot of the time much easier than what I expected to be easy. As you might expect for making your own script runtime, I've been needing to teach my myself assembly language as I go along. This has led to some very interesting discoveries on my part. For example, the way that division works on the CPU end is very interesting, because the number getting divided must be stored in two registers at once. This is so you can divide super large numbers, but it ended up causing me a lot of problems until I figured it out that this was the case. When I first set it up, I was just passing zero to the upper register, and then the number I wanted to be divided to the lower register, and that worked fine until I tried using negative numbers. The way that computers store negative numbers is very interesting. Interesting. If you look into it, you learn that each one or zero in a sequence of bytes is a power of two. The one all the way to the right would represent one, then two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, and so on. Then you just see which bytes are on and then add them together. This is great, but how do you store negative numbers? It's a little complicated, but makes sense once you figure out the reasoning. Anything above half the max value of an int is negative and counted backwards. So if you have the number 127 stored in an 8-bit int and then you add one to it, Instead of getting 128, instead you'll get negative 128. This makes it so if you add negative 4 and 8 together, you don't need to worry about the fact that the 4 is negative, because when the numbers go past their max, the result just wraps back around and gives you a positive number. Knowing this, you can probably see how replacing the top half of a number with only zeros could be a problem when you want something to stay negative. Luckily, there's an assembly language command that seems created for this exact situation, and it does what's called a sign extension. Or in less fancy terms, if the value in this register is negative, it's gets all the bits in this register to 1. Once I started doing this, my division operations no longer create uncatchable operating system errors. Yay! The other thing that feels harder than it needs to be is how comparison works. These are your greater than, less than or equal to, etc. In assembly language, the way this works is that every time you want to compare two numbers, you use the CMP or compare command. And then instead of getting a single boolean result for one operation, instead you get the result of every comparison that you could possibly do in a single command. Those results are then stored in the CPU as uh, a set of flags. You can then conditionally execute commands that only execute if a flag is set to check their values. Now, it's not the compare then check flags workflow that I'm complaining about. It's your mom. <laughs> that makes sense. What doesn't make sense is that signed and unsigned numbers use different flags for the greater than less than operations, meaning that you need to remember an extra four or so duplicated versions of commands for the signed and unsigned. The commands do the exact same thing, just for different signs. Notice how they are due for two different commands for the same thing? Because it just can't be simple. Okay. And for some reason, float comparisons set unsigned flags, even though float values store signed values that can store negatives. But it's fine. It's all fine. After I figured that all out and had conditions working, it was actually super simple to add in if statements and while loops. Fun fact, you know how people always treat go-to statements like the devil? Well, in assembly language, that's the only thing you have, and you can use them to create every single type of flow control statement. Want an if statement? Just have a jump that skips past its containing code if your condition is false. Want a while loop? Do the same thing as for an if statement, but put a jump that goes back to before the condition code at the end of the, the statement thing. Yeah. But wait, now that we have loops and internal function calls, that means we can run some benchmarks, even though these benchmarks don't use loops. I am now realizing this and see how fast the language is. I should make it clear that the point isn't to figure out exactly how fast these languages are, but just to give a general idea how fast they are relative to each other and make sure I haven't coded the slowest thing on the planet. To accurately benchmark and compare my language's runtime to the speed of other languages would take a lot more work than I currently have time for, so we're just going to test out what I think is most important for mine, and that is function calls. Since the engine is based around ECS, that means a script function is getting called from C++ once per every entity in the scene, multiple times per frame, so we need to make sure that this is as efficient as possible. To test this, I decided to code up a deliberately inefficient recursive version of the Fibonacci sequence in six different languages. I wanted to make sure this is as fair as possible, so for both BS and native functions, they are both tested by the same templated code. And yes, I am going to start unironically referring to it as BS, because it is. 
You will notice that I'm testing both ints and floats separately. Why did I do this? Because I felt like it. Though it did lead to some interesting discoveries later on. Scrolling through, you can see that I have duplicate versions of the functions for BS. And at the very bottom, you can see where we actually call the test functions after we've run some other tests to make sure that they do in fact generate pretty math spiral. So pretty. <laughs> Running it, we get these results, and they're kind of what you would expect. They're pretty close, all things considered, with C++ optimization black magic taking the lead by about 15% or so. Next, we have C Sharp, which, if I were to go with the pre-existing runtime for my game engine, it's what I would be using. Here's the test script, and here are the results. Something interesting happened here. For the version using integers, is about 200 milliseconds faster than my scripting language, but when using floats, it suddenly halves the speed and takes twice as long. I'm running all of these tests in release mode without an attached debugger, so I don't feel like anything like this should happen. But going off previous videos I've posted, you guys will give me five or six different theories on why this is happening. But a win is a win. 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 Let's look at the next contender. Lua. To give it the best chance possible, I'm using LuaJIT, which promises just-in-time compilation for amazing speeds. I was originally going to use it as a placeholder before creating my own, but you can see how that worked out. Anyway, as with all the others, the function is exactly the same, but I will point out that I call the testing function before recording the result just to make sure that the compilation isn't being included in the final result. Running it, we see that it takes roughly twice as long to complete. Which really surprised me, because I was led to believe that JIT compiled Lua was the end-all be-all of speed, but no, apparently in my month-old half-assed runtime beats it in my completely practical, thorough, and accurate tests. Faced. And finally some honorable mentions. I tested both JavaScript and Python, mostly because I was curious and a little because I like bashing on both of them. JavaScript, unfortunately, did almost exactly the same as Lua, leaving me little to no room to smack talk it, so we're going to move on. Python, on the other hand, bashes itself. I'll just let these numbers speak for themselves. Yeah. Now, before moving on, let me address something that I feel like some of you might call me out on, and that's the fact that when I tested BrainScript, unlike all of the other tests, the while loop wasn't contained in the scripting language itself. I personally don't think this is a problem, because I think it makes the test more accurate, at least for BS, because this is the intended use case. Other coding languages in this list are supposed to be good at running fast in their own contained environments, whereas mine is supposed to be really good at executing calls from an external runtime, or language. If I wanted to have a more accurate comparison, the first thing I would do is try to embed every single one of these other languages and try calling them repeatedly in the same way. But that would take forever to set up, and I'm already taking too long to write these scripts. Now, let's talk about structs, arguably the most important part of this whole thing. I'm still working on nailing them down, but I have them working with the exception of a few edge cases. I had planned to treat them in a similar way to working with C-sharp, where they're allocated on the heap, but instead of using a garbage collector for memory, we'd use reference counting, similar to Rust pointers. The idea behind this was that it would mesh really well with ECS calls, where I'm passing in pointers to component structs, and also making it so people don't need to worry about memory leaks or management. But I hadn't figured out how to handle the reference counting yet? And then I realized something. At the moment, BrainScript is designed not to store state, so there's absolutely no reason not to just store all the structs on the stack and then pass them around with references. The only problem is passing them to and returning them from functions. It turns out that function calling conventions don't say anything about the correct way to handle returning structs, and the compilers themselves can't even decide on the correct method. That's why you should always pass things by reference when possible. As far as I can tell, there are two main methods. The preferred one is adding a secret argument that passes a pointer to the place that you want to return it to. And then there's the way I did it. For this method, you copy the struct to the heap and then return it as a pointer and then copy it back again to the stack when you sign it. The reason I went with this is because it works well with the C++ API and makes it super easy to return structs back to the native code side. I'll just put big disclaimers everywhere on the documentation advising people to avoid returning structs since it's relatively slow. I also added a way to define struct references, so you will still be able to pass them to functions and then modify them that way. You can define them either inside the script itself or using the C++ API. Then you can use them just like you regularly would. And they're perfectly compatible with native C structs. In fact, they're identical, if my padding function works correctly. So if you define an identical native C struct, you can then pass a pointer to one into a brain script function, and it works just fine. You can even have BS functions return pointers to a struct they created internally, all a part of decreasing the cost of function calls. Speaking of function calls, that segues into the second most important part of the language, 
and that's API calls. This is another area that I'm not quite done working on since I haven't decided the sort of syntax I'm going to use for libraries and static functions, but other than that, it's already working quite well. One of the big ideas of the language is that it's as simple as possible, and then you can extend its functionality by providing it with libraries of external functions. For instance, an API to interact with entity component system, or a math library. Now let's see, what else was there to go over? Come on, man. Get up. Footage have been removed from all databases in order to protect the security of the Meta Corporation. Please contact your nearest Meta supervisor if you have been in contact with any individuals shown in this recording. Thank you for your cooperation. All of this is cap. I'm lying, it's not open source. The scripting language doesn't exist, it's all for the views. Now let's go sign up for the Patreon. <laughs> <laughs>